Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the second day of uh, NERM organized by LC Prague, Czech Republic. And today we will move to the National Park Šumava, our largest national park. And we want to introduce you Life for Myers project. But before we start, it's my pleasure to welcome here uh, Deputy Director of Šumava National Park for the Department of Nature Protection, Mr. Martin Starry, who also used to be a some member in the past. And he also want to welcome you so uh, now I give you the floor, Mr. Stavi. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Great. Hello, everyone. It's really good. Uh, it's really big pleasure for me to uh, to be with you and to have the opportunity to uh, to welcome you to uh, to your uh, meeting uh, yesterday when Lukáš Lind uh, Linhart, my a uh, co-worker and a friend of mine uh, asked me to uh, to say some words um, at the beginning of your today's meeting. Um, uh, I, 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 I thought to myself, you've, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know what to say you about the water retention, uh, but <laughs> I will try to and um, and uh, hopefully it will uh, have some meanings. But on the other hand, I think uh, more important is uh, for me uh, to be with you and to share uh, my experience uh, with you because I'm really, really glad uh, that the LC uh, Prague is doing such a great work and is so, uh, so active because more than 10 years ago, I uh, came back uh, as a student of, uh, of forestry. I came back from my Erasmus uh, uh, year in uh, Freising back to uh, Prague. And at the time we were talking to, uh, to, Mr., uh, to our Dean in Prague and persuade him to, uh, to pay uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the fee uh, to become uh, a member of IFSA. And at that time, uh, the student association most was then uh, included into the IFSA. But at that time, I uh, we were not so active because at that time I was a part of uh, uh, IAAS, uh, so Agriculture Students Association, and uh, we were not so active uh, within the IFSA. And I'm really, really glad uh, that. Uh, uh, that you are active and you, you are you are doing so so well. So uh, thank you. Um, you know I'm I'm forester and I started to work uh, uh, right after I um, I graduate on uh, on the Faculty of Forestry in in Prague and I started to work in uh, Sh uh, in Shumova National Park and. Um, it was uh, right at the beginning, it was a little bit shock for me um, because uh, I started to work in a dead forest and uh, the, the most of the trees I was facing uh, almost every day were dead. And, um, but on the other hand, I was, uh, uh, oh, I was raised by, uh, by, my, um, by my father and by my, uh, by my grandfather. Uh, who were always um, uh, nature protection uh, fans and uh, and also um, uh, scientists. So, so I was like uh, open-minded, uh, although I, it was a kind of shock. And um, I uh, started to work there, and it was just like uh, the habit for for me. Uh, after a couple of months I got used to the dead trees and uh, I have to say right now that I, when I when I go to the commercial forest it is kind of strange uh, strange feeling not to see the dead wood and not to see all the microhabitats uh, we have 
but um, so the point uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, we as humans have uh, feelings and feelings influence us as uh, as a humans by our decisions quite a lot so um, so um, we have to keep it mind it's not about uh, avoid uh, the feelings and uh, but uh, we have to keep in mind that that these in, uh, feelings are influencing us and uh, sometimes it's it's fine uh, to listen to uh, to them and I'm also really glad that um, that uh, two years ago uh, a big uh, life uh, project uh, was successfully uh, launched and the uh, colleague of mine Lukas Linhardt uh, can present you uh, the, uh, the results and uh, and the the uh, the, um, the, the the details of our uh, restoration uh, restoration project. Um, the slogan of uh, of um, of of our colleagues, uh, and they uh, very uh, frequently uh, used to say that um, um, the uh, landscape without marshlands and wetlands is a landscape without water. And the landscape without um, water is the landscape uh, uh, without life. And we as a foresters, uh, we have to keep in mind that the, the, the water is, is really very important uh, for uh, the uh, forest ecosystem. And it's also very important for the, uh, for the forest as, as, as a habitat and as, as a part of the agriculture. So I wish you a good luck for today's uh, meeting. Hope you stay uh, so active as, as you are. And I, host, I hope that um, that uh, we will be uh, it would be possible to meet you uh, in person uh, in Shumava National Park, not just so online, but in real, and talk to you and show you uh, the beauties of our national park. So good luck and have a good day. Thank you very much for your nice words, and that you could join us at least for a while. Hopefully one day we can we can uh, bring all the participants there personally also because uh, it's very pretty that we can show them all the nice places there. And right now we will move to we prepared a video about the Life for Myers project. But before we, we will show, show it to you, uh, I would like to thank again to Minister of Agriculture Miroslav Toman who took over the auspices of the whole event and with the support of Ministry of Agriculture of the Czech Republic, we had the opportunity to make this video, so thank you very much. And we also thank to our Faculty of Forestry and Wood Sciences in Prague for their support. So I think we can move uh, to the video, so on type you are ready. Yes, I'll play it. Okay. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Lucas and I also used to be a member of IFSA uh, through LC Prague and in 2014 me and my friends organized a conference uh, about forest management in the National Park Šumava and here I find myself today working for the National Park uh, and I'm responsible for communication uh, in the Life for Myers project which focuses on restoration of peatlands and other kinds of wetlands here in Shumava Mountains. And today I'm gonna show you a couple of sites which we are restoring uh, within the project and also one site which was restored in 2013. The whole mountain ridge, which is located on the border of the Czech Republic and Bavaria, is covered with wetlands. 30% of the whole area of the National Park are bog forests, waterlogged forests, waterlogged meadows, peaty meadows and spring areas. Unfortunately, in the past, 50% of these wetlands were drained for forestry purposes and agricultural purposes. In 1991, 
when the national park was established, the first employees started monitoring these wetlands and also thinking about their restorations. They managed to adopt the first restoration measures and until 2018, they managed to restore up to 600 hectares of peatlands and four and a half kilometers of small mountain streams. The Life for Myers project, which is founded from the LIFE program of the European Union, is transboundary. We have two partners in Bavaria, that's the administration of National Park Bavarian Forest and Bund Naturschutz, and also one partner on the Czech side, and that's the South Bohemian University in České Budějovice. Together, we are planning to restore over 2,000 hectares of wetlands in 43 sites on the Czech side and four sites on the German side. The first project site I would like to show you today is very close to the border with Germany and it's actually really symbolic because it's right on the Iron Curtain which was here during the era of socialism. As you can see behind me, it is a forested spring area and the wet meadows below it and all of this was drained in the past and last year we blocked all the drainage ditches and restored the small streams that are coming out of the spring area. Right now we are standing next to one of the drainage ditches which were here before restoration and you can see it on the photo. To support water retention on site and raise the underground water table we had to fill the ditches with soil but also we used a cascade of wooden dams to stop water erosion. This little forest stream used to flow in the bottom of a very deep drainage ditch. And to stop erosion and drying out of the whole spring area, we needed to bring it back to the surface. To do that, we used a special restoration method of buried wooden dams and creating of a new and shallow stream bed. When adopting restoration measures, we are not only thinking about water, but we are also trying to build the structure of the forest stand to support the water regime as a whole. The forest stand behind me is fairly thick and it's not really favorable for other kinds of plant species. So what we did is that we came in with small clearings to bring in more light and enhance and support the growth of sphagnum mosses and other kinds of plants. Because the project measures cost quite a lot of money, we also need to learn about the success of restoration works. That's why we are monitoring the vegetation, the changes in water quality, uh, the ratio of outflow from the site and the underground water table. Then we compare the data before and after restoration and we get to know if we were successful in terms of water retention, supporting the wetland habitat and slowing down the outflow of water from the landscape. For a long time, all the water from the spring areas was flowing through the system of drainage ditches in completely different directions. When you take a look at the map before and after restoration, you can see that when we adopted the restoration measures, we wanted to make sure that we put it back into the original pathways. And that is the case of the little stream we're standing by, which is one of those marked in yellow in the map. We're at the second project site I would like to show you today. And it's an even-aged spruced forest, which was planted before the establishment of the national park. And uh, the reason we are here is that I would like to demonstrate that it's not really necessary to adopt the restoration measures only in protected areas, but you can also do it in a forest which is designated to yield and timber production. It is extremely important to retain water in stands with spruce, because with its shallow root system, it is very susceptible to drought periods. About 80% of forested spring areas in the Czech Republic have been drained in the past. And that is the reason why one of the very important aims of this project is to disseminate the knowledge about restoration sites like this. This forest is also in a spring slope and the little mountain stream here hadn't been here for a while due to drainage. And what happened is that all the spring water coming down 
these two drainage ditches was directed into the straight way in the bottom of the drainage ditch down the forest. So what we did here again is blocking the drainage channels to slow down the outflow from the area and restoring the original outflow into the small, shallow and slow stream. Right now we are in a little fragment of alder forest which was, believe it or not, also drained in the past and you can see the state before restoration on the photograph enclosed. Talking about the mitigation of climate change, I just want to say that it's not only important to do restoration works in the forest stands, but also to keep these little fragments of forest that are dedicated to the water supply and they are also very important for biodiversity. The third restoration I would like to show you is a bit older. The book forest behind me was restored in 2004 and you can see that the result is fairly decent. The water table in the channel raised up, the wooden dams are working nicely and the whole channel is overgrowing with this sphagnum moss, which is a crucial component of all peatlands. The whole network of drainage ditches, which you can see on the map in light blue color, basically disappeared from the surface and it's overgrown by the sphagnum species, which retains a lot of water. The bog forests at this site developed in the floodplains of a mountain stream, which was also channelized in the past and directed into this deep and straight channel. But in 2013, the restoration works were done and the stream was put back into the original course. When you're working on restoration of a stream like this, you have to strictly follow the river dynamics, meaning that you have to create a shallow meandering stream bed with the faster sections like this and the erosion banks where the water spends its energy, slows down, and like that you avoid the erosion into the bottom and drying out of the area. When you take a look at the map again, the dark blue color is showing the state of the stream before restoration and the red dotted line after restoration. Due to the new shape of the stream, it will always stay at the surface and it can spill into the flooding area during floods and that means that that will lower the risk of flooding further in the landscape. Well, that's it for today. I'm really glad that I could show you some of the project measures and the efforts that we put into mitigation of climate change here in Shumava National Park. If anybody's interested, you are all welcome for an excursion. Bye bye. Okay, so that was it. I'm sorry for the technical issues that the video was not that fluent. But anyway, we will uh, share it with you in, or in the better quality soon. So then you can watch it again and uh, enjoy it. And right now I would like to already welcome uh, our friend Lukáš. He used to be also if some member of LC Prague, as he said in the video. And he actually established our LC like seven years ago. So. It's a pleasure to welcome you here and uh, he will also tell you something more about the project and, uh, and his work in Shumava National Park. Thank you very much. Hi guys, nice to see you at least like this. <laughs> Hello. Um, I have to correct Marek a little bit because I didn't establish the LC but re-established <laughs> because okay. he was there as Martin was saying before and then there was um, little pause when nobody wanted to take care of it and we re-established it and we were we are also really glad that uh the guys and students at the faculty are are continuing in our work so i'm going to uh share a presentation 
and talk about the project project a little bit more in detail. And let me just do this. Can you see it now? Yes. Michael, yes. can you? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, this is a presentation that I like to show to people who are uh, engaged in forestry and nature protection, and but also uh, to the public. So, so there are a couple of uh, things which are pretty obvious and you already know about this because you learned some of these things um, during your studies. Some of them maybe at basic school, some of them at high schools and universities, but still I, I really like to repeat uh, what uh, like the basic things so that we actually realize what we are talking about, that it's water and it's, a, it's one of the most important things in our lives. So, this is a fun part. I just uh, want you to guess how many percent of water is there in human body. Does anybody know? Around 70. Yep, it's somewhere between 60 and 70. So that's pretty important. Then one more important thing wine i'm not gonna let you guess now it's 80 percent and maybe some of the people from northern europe will uh, be curious in this how, how many percent is in coffee that's 99.5 you may you may know that the northern states drink a lot of coffee <laughs> uh, but anyway so what uh, does water mean in the landscape, uh, we, we like to call it a medium that is carrying information and enriches, uh, enriches the environment and, and, you know, sending information, mostly genetic information in the landscape. So we like to uh, say that the landscape is actually uh, pretty, pretty similar to a human body. If you imagine the system of veins in human body, uh, it really resembles the system of rivers and stream in the landscape. So, uh, if if you if you want to think of wetlands and uh, rivers as the organs in human body, then you you get to know uh, that wetlands uh, are really important, and and you can call them the organs of the landscape. So, but uh, lately, uh, or I mean, in the recent past, people didn't really treat water well, especially in the Czech Republic, because, uh, you know, we have done a lot of drainage in the landscape, in agriculture landscape, uh, and, um, you know, we are intensifying the agriculture, and uh, also we are building very many industrial halls so so now we can see that with the change of weather uh, it's causing a lot of soil erosion uh, wind erosion and uh, also the runoff uh, of water uh, is really fast when it's you know when, when there are many of these uh, in industrial halls so it makes big differences in you know soaking water into the soil and stuff like that. Uh, so the results of what we have done to the landscape in the Czech Republic is that uh, in the 50s, uh, the study said that we had a million and 300,000 hectares of wetlands in the, in the, in the state, uh, in our country. And after the era of socialism, when we have done many, many drainage systems, we have made very many drainage systems. Uh, we only have 
350,000 hectares, which is almost a million hectares of wetlands that are gone from the country um, and drained. And it's, it's one eighth of the whole country. So it's, it's a really big impact on the water regime. And now think again about the human body. How would the, the body work if, if it lost so many organs? So that, that really gives us an idea about uh, what uh, we have caused. So when we're counting what it brought, uh, so it's a lot of drought periods that we've experienced recently. And uh, uh, the, the seepage into underground uh, is, is very limited. So some of the people uh, in, in some villages already are missing their water in the wells. It's, it's becoming a big issue. And uh, we have insufficient flow in the river, uh, in the rivers during uh, summer periods, uh, which were uh, really dry lately. And that causes uh, the lack of water in industry and also lack of water for dilution of gray water. And uh, when we think about forestry, uh, it, it has been also quite uh, intensified uh, in the past. Uh, we plant a lot of uh, and grow a lot of uh, spruce and uh, this causes a big problem with beetle outbreaks. Because as I was saying in the video, uh, with the shallow root system of spruce, uh, it, it is one of the trees that is most susceptible to uh, drought. And uh, it causes that it's very, very um, easy for the bark beetles to, to outbreak. And uh, then because of the really fast runoff of water from the landscape, we have very many uh, floods. And also we, uh, with, the, with the loss of wetlands, we lost a lot of habitats for wildlife and, and plant species. So I'm gonna, uh, can, you, can you guys still hear me? Is everything okay? Yes. Yes, yes. we hear you very well. Thank you, perfect. So I'm gonna go to Shumava and uh, I just uh, I want to show a little map uh, so that you, uh, you actually realize where these mountains are. It's, it's on the border with uh, Bavaria, Czech Republic and Bavaria, and also a little bit in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Austria. So this is Prague, this is uh, Wien and Munich. And so uh, the history of the mountains is pretty rich. Um, they, uh, the, the mountain ridge was created during the uh, Varisian Orthogeny, which was in the era of Paleozoic. So it's very long ago. And uh, because of that, uh, most of the ridge contains of granite, right? But uh, because it's so long, so such a long time uh, in the past when it was created, uh, it was a long time a subject of erosion. So that, uh, that is why the topography of the mountains is really a sort of undulating. Uh, we don't really have very many steep mountains and hills, but it, it's, it's more hilly and, and flat, especially on the top. We have plains, uh, pretty, uh, pretty uh, big area of plains on the top of the mountains. So because it's of granite, uh, we have really acidic conditions and the, the environment is really cold because it's uh, the top of the mountains is around uh, 1300 uh, meters above sea level. And there's a lot of precipitation in, in the plains. There are places where you can measure about uh, 1300 millimeters uh, per year of precipitation. So that makes perfect conditions for uh, sphagnum to grow. And uh, as a result of all these conditions, uh, the sphagnum moss uh, spread uh, over the, you know, quite a big, big part of the area of the national park. And nowadays 
in these times. Uh, it resulted in one tenth of the uh, national park on the Czech side uh, of, you know, it's covered, one tenth is covered in, uh, in pe with peatlands. So that's quite a big portion. And uh, uh, on the plains, uh, we have raised bog like this, uh, quite many, and, uh, or like this. Those are the, the bogs there that was that were created up in the mountains uh, so they're called mountain raised bogs and also we have a couple of really vast uh, floodplains of two big rivers where these um, valley raised bogs were created and when you took a, take a look at this photo uh, this is actually the uh, greatest um, the greatest uh, raised bog in the Czech Republic it has it has 300 hectares and it's in the valley of Vltava River. And so let's take a look into the history of drainage because, you know, people uh, lived in the mountains and they needed to, uh, you know, uh, plant, uh, uh, sorry, grow wood and take the advantage of wood and also do a little bit of agriculture. Uh, so they sometimes needed to drain some of these wetlands because, uh, you know, one third of the whole mountains are wetlands. So, so people really needed to uh, use some of, some of the peat and also uh, drain the, the meadows for haymaking and stuff like that. So we can divide the uh, history of drainage into two stages. The first one is before uh, the Second World War. And that was mainly for forestry purposes. So, so the old foresters you know, made very many drainage ditches in the bog forest so that the wood fa uh, gr grows faster and uh, the the local inhabitants uh, made quite many uh, shallow drainage ditches in the meadows so that they can uh, do a little bit of agriculture around their settlements. And then uh, the second stage uh, was the era of socialism. And that was the time when, um, when the area of the mountain ridge was actually a military area. So the soldiers had quite a lot of time because they were, you know, guarding the borders, but also they, are, they were, you know, engaged in farming. So they used uh, the excavators and uh, machines that they had uh, to uh, build new drainage ditches or to deepen those that the old inhabitants made. Uh, and it caused some really vast uh, problems, big problems with, with uh, drying out of, of very many, uh, very many forests and very many meadows and spring areas. And also when they were trying to cultivate the agricultural land, they were straightening streams and uh, you know because it's it's an area which is flat and pretty easy for uh, access uh, for machines so they wanted to use the floodplains for agriculture and uh, that caused the drying out of waterlogged and peaty meadows here in the mountains so this is a pro this is a this is a case of a drained um, spring area in slope. So these drainage ditches are actually about one and a half meters to two and a half meters deep. So normally you would have a very wet area all over this place here. And, uh, but because of this drainage, all the water is coming down here and just, you know, the wetlands is basically uh, in a, uh, let's say, in the bottom of the of the ditch, 
So nowhere else. This is all dry. And then one of the reasons of uh, drainage was actually, was actually peat extraction. So people used to drain uh, the raised bogs. Uh, they, they, after drainage, they uh, used these special shovels and made, the, made these bricks of peat. And he, they used it for heating and also for, uh, for cattle. Uh, and then we also have a couple of sites which were industrially cut with machines uh, up to 2014, actually. And it's on the very border of the national park out of the national park, but on the border. And it used to be a really um, beautiful raised bog. So this Somarska bog is already restored. And this Vlčiami bog uh, is the subject of our project. And we will restore it this year. And then, as I was saying, a lot of uh, the waterlogged uh, forests were drained and you can see how it looks so normally it's all like this site is also a spring area so it, all, all the forest would be uh, really uh, open small trees growing really slowly but after drainage you have you, you got a normal pretty normal site with a, pre a pretty good increment so that's why the foresters did this but today it's becoming a problem for us. And also uh, the Shumava National Park is, uh, you know, really has a, has a really, um, let's say thick or uh, a good infrastructure of roads uh, when we're talking about forestry because it was uh, used as, as a source of commercial forests in the past. So there are very many roads and also the Iron Curtain was created after the Second World War, which is visible on this map here. And they didn't really care if it was cutting or wasn't cutting any wetlands. So, so many of the raised bogs in, up in the mountains were drained because of the Iron Curtain. So, so the forest roads and, the, and this, this uh, big road uh, was actually, uh, are still, um, a big problem for the water regime as well. This is next, this is a drainage channel next to the Iron Curtain. So you can imagine that a lot of water coming down the hills is just, you know, taken away by this ditch and directed into completely different uh, places. This is an example of a forest road. You, you see that uh, uh, the water is soaking through the profile here and it's all again directed on the road. So the results of uh, all this drainage I was talking about uh, is that, you know, the whole area of 68,000 hectares of the national park um, was covered uh, in one third with wetlands and 50% of that was drained. So one half of the, all the wetlands were drained in the Shumava uh, National Park. And I was saying that one tenth of the area are peatlands and those were actually drained uh, in 70%. So you can imagine that is a, it's a big impact for the water regime. This is a map showing the peatlands. The raised bogs and uh, the bog forests in blue. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, the raised bogs are in uh, red, and all the other like like meadow, wet meadows and peaty meadows and and bog forests are in blue. So how do we restore? Uh, this is a case of a bog forest, and it was cut through with a system of drainage ditches. So if you imagine the past, uh, this is this is a imitation of how the peatlands were uh, created in the in the natural 
conditions. So approximately 9,000 years ago, you can imagine that you had a slope like this with a depression which collected water. And then the sphagnum moss came in and started growing. And over the two uh, 9,000 uh, years, uh, the moss was growing and growing and actually grew uh, a layer of peat, which, which can be up to uh, seven or eight meters thick. So you have a nice uh, raised bog in the mountains. But then uh, the people came with drainage. They made a ditch inside and all the water was gone. And then the, 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 the peatland, the, the raised bog starting dry, started drying out and uh, degrading and the trees started growing faster on it. And to stop this degradation, you know, people in Shumava, the employees started uh, with restorations. So what they did is that came in with an excavator and built these dams on the channel. And like that, they stopped water from flowing down in the bottom of the ditch and it filled with water again. And the degradation process was stopped. You can see it in the photo how it looks. This is a bog forest which was restored. And the system, how we do it, or the concept is called tar target water com concept. And it's very simple. So uh, you know in which kind of biotope you're working. Uh, if you're in a raised bog, the water table is usually somewhere around five centimeters under the surface. Then if you're working in a bog forest, that's usually about 30 centimeters under, sur under the surface. So you know the target water table which you want to uh, which you want to get to after restoration works. And you also know the gradient, the surface gradient. And uh, with these two numbers, you actually count how many of these wooden dams have to be installed into the drainage ditch to uh, have a good success of the restoration. It's very simple, but it's also uh, very important. So you can see how, uh, what, what are the results of drainage in a slope uh, peaty meadow. And this is the result of restoration a couple of years after the works. So you stop the water and the profile of soil uh, gets soaked with water again and the plant species, the wetland plant species are coming back in. Uh, this is actually one of the sites which was restored in 2007. You can see that they were building the dams here, then it filled and it's overgrowing with sphagnum and aerophorum and other kinds of species which, uh, which you normally find in a, in a peatland. And uh, I just want to say that it is not like the aim of the restoration is not to have a cascade of pools like this, but the aim is also uh, always uh, the, that the drainage ditch has to overgrow and disappear from the surface. So if it's possible uh, and, and if there's any material around uh, deposited from the time when the ditches were created, uh, we put it all back. And, you know, the most important is to uh, stuff it around the, the wooden dams. And the less, the less uh, open water here is, the, the better the result is and the faster the, overgrow, the overgrowing is. So let's take a look at the case of streams now. Uh, so the problem here is that when, you, when people straightened the streams in the past, we've lost <clears throat> the morphology of the stream and lost also the, the floodplains and the whole wetland which was in the floodplains of the stream. No matter it was a big stream, uh, 
tiny little stream uh, or a big river, uh, they always in the natural state have, you know, scale. goes spill into the floodplains and, and it works as a whole system. The water is not only in the course of the stream, but also around it. So when you take a look uh, at how the bottom of the stream looks uh, in a meander, you see that it's really shallow and that the main course of water is in the side. It's hitting the meander bank here. And like that, the water is spending the energy into the bottom and the meander is still moving uh, and changing. And like that, you know, some of the cut meanders, the Oxbow Lakes can be created. And uh, that's the natural state. And that's why the stream always stays shallow and can spill easily. Uh, into the floodplains because it, because it has a small capacity. So, but what people did is that they, uh, you know, deepened the, the course and straightened it. And it has a big capacity, so it doesn't spill into the floodplains. And actually the, the erosion goes into the bottom because uh, the, the water course cannot really you know, move around from bank to bank. So, so that causes even stronger erosion uh, and, and drying of the area because the lower the water goes, uh, the worse the situation is. So this is one of the cases of a straightened stream. You see that all this around here is pretty much dry. And this is another problem uh, of these, uh, these uh, changed streams that it's also, you know, shorter than the original stream. And like that, you have to, you know, because, because the, the uh, surface, uh, or how to say this, so the course of a natural stream is longer. So it has a longer way for, you know, um, sort of flowing through the gradient. But, but when it's straight, the gradient has to be covered with these steps. And it's a big problem for migra migration of species, uh, specific specifically trout, fish, and uh, these kinds of larger species, but also insects and other kinds of species. So, uh, but I have to say that in Shumava National Park, we also have very, very many of beautiful water courses, uh, which have no problem at all. This is one of them. So when we are restoring a stream, uh, you can see that uh, we usually do it with an excavator. It's the fastest, uh, fastest uh, way to do it. And uh, as I was saying in the video, we are always thinking about the right morphology of the stream bed. You see that we're making the pools here and the, uh, and the shallow sections which are fastening. So this is after restoration with the first water coming in. And this is a couple of years after restoration. Uh, and you see that the water is is doing its job and it's you know moving around all the sediments and this stream actually changes every year of the the spring floods and this is a photo of this stream before restoration and this is a photo after restoration marek took this photo when we made the video beautiful no <laughs> And this is another um, stream which was restored. And you may notice that, as I was saying, the water can spill easily. So the, the floodplain, the little floodplain of this tiny little stream is still, uh, you know, concerned as wetland. And here is uh, the problem of 
you know, forest roads and any other ditches. So if you imagine that you have a mountain and the it, it, here is a spring slope and quite many streams might be coming down this slope. But when you create a road, uh, you usually also make a ditch next to it. And all the water from this direction is chained to this direction. So the, the forest below the road uh, is actually losing its water. And this is the case of a real situation of the Chernohorsky Mochal, which is the raised bog, cut with the iron curtain. And what they did was just ease, you know, here is the drainage channel, they blocked the ditches and they just put the water from the stream back into the uh, forest again. And they didn't need to do anything in the forest and the stream just found its own uh, stream bed, which was empty for 40 years. And the result is just perfect. It, now it looks like it, like if it was always there. So sometimes the restoration is fairly easy. And uh, we are also uh, focusing on the spring slope, uh, spring slopes here in Shumava National Park. And uh, there are very many of these which used to be all wet, but they were cut through with the drainage ditches. You see that the water is only in the bottom, no water out here. And uh, this is how it looks when we restore a, a spring area like this. I'll, I'll be talking about the methods later on. So what was happening in the national park? Uh, as, I, as I said, uh, the the National Park was established in 1999. And the first people, the, the employees that came here uh, were monitoring uh, the, air, the area of the National Park. And they learned that very many of these wetlands were drained and uh, they, they were really concerned about it because some of the very rare peat books were also drained and they were thinking, oh my God, we have to do something with this. So uh, they started uh, studying about restoration methods and the one of the women who is the leader of our project now uh, traveled to Scotland and Scandinavia and she was trying to, you know, find information about restorations in peatlands. And so in 1999, uh, they made the first restoration of a peat bog and until 2018 uh, she and her team uh, managed to restore 600 hectares of wetlands and four uh, over four kilometers of small streams and then uh, they applied for the life for miles project and uh, they were successful. And in 2018, we started uh, with this project. And the aim of the project is to restore wetlands on an area of 2,059 hectares and to restore 13 kilometers of small streams. Uh, so so 40, 43 sites of the project are on the Czech side and four sites are on the German side. And uh, so most of the work is done in the Czech Republic. But the German National Park, uh, Bavarian Forest, they already had a life project plus uh, before this project. And they, they also uh, restored very many wetlands. So in this project, they're only focusing on communication with public and also uh, on monitoring of the wetlands they, of the peatlands that they had already restored. And then we have Bund Naturschutz, which is one of the biggest uh, nature protection uh, organizations in, the, in, in Germany. And uh, they are actually trying to uh, restore four sites uh, close to the border with the Czech Republic uh, around human settlements. So they are focusing on um, 
communication with local people and the mayors and they are trying to explain why it is important to restore wetlands and uh, they are actually also buying some land uh, where they can restore uh, little fragments of peatlands. And then we have uh, the university uh, in Budweis and uh, these, uh, these people are taking care of uh, a part of the monitor Terrain, which I'm going to talk about later. So why is it important to restore and return wetlands into the landscape? Uh, well, one of the things that is pretty obvious is that uh, they retain a lot of water in the landscape. So if you, if you take a look at the profile of a peat bog on the left side here, and the profile of a dried peat bog, it makes a big difference because uh, the, the peat bog in the natural state is really spongy, let's say, and it retains so much water. Uh, it, it contains of the leftovers of undecomposed uh, peat and uh, other natural material. And uh, when you drain it, uh, you lose the water and the um, microbes and and uh, other other species can go in there and decompose the peat. So as they're uh, decomposing it, it's actually mineralizing and it's losing the spongy structure. So uh, after all, you you get a totally black and mineralized, uh, really rich soil, but it doesn't have the structure. Uh, which can retain so much water anymore. So that's why we are trying to stop the process of degradation and re-establish the process of uh, peat forming. And uh, so, so the, the heart of the national park are the Modrava Plains, uh, which can actually retain uh, in the natural state approximately 20 million cubic meters of water, which is a pretty great amount of water. So, so the whole system of peatlands up in the mountains is really important for water supply as well. And when you when you imagine a catchment of one stream, uh, it can be very very uh, uh, different in terms of water retention. When you have all the uh, wetlands in the natural state, it retains a lot of water and uh, the runoff of water after a big rain uh, is actually way slower. So when the rainfall you know, falls on the landscape, the, the wetlands just catch it in and send it into the river slowly. Uh, as opposed to this case, where uh, the uh, wetlands are drained and all the water goes, you know, flows out of the area really fast. And that, that may cause even floods lower in the landscape. So this is my little creation. I'm sorry that it's not in English, uh, but it's talking about uh, the use of the solar power uh, input uh, which uh, in different types of, of landscapes. So when you have a landscape with just you know st good structure, small meadows, uh, a lot of vegetation, uh, wetlands and and uh, just just good structure. Uh, so five to ten percent goes into heating the ground, the soil, about 5 to 10 percent reflects and then about uh, 5 to 10 percent goes uh, mm, is heat emission and but most of the energy of uh, the sun is spent for evapotranspiration and it can be up to 70 to 80 percent. So like that, 
the energy, like most, the majority of the energy is spent and uh, the, the landscape is actually cooling down due to that, as opposed to this case, uh, where you have just a very big block of of agriculture area with a little leftover of a wetland. Uh, so, so in this case, uh, these uh, figures are pretty much the same. Uh, about 10 to 20 percent uh, is spent for evapotranspiration, but 60 to 70 percent is just emitting the uh, the heat. So the energy goes back into the air. So, and that makes a big difference. And it's all about the small water cycle. And that's why we are also uh, in the project monitoring the cooling effect of uh, wetlands so that we actually have some numbers and data to show to people, you see? Uh, so so this, these are the thermo pictures of uh, our research plots on the sites uh, and you see that in detail this is the drainage ditch and these are the trees and they are all nice and uh, cool uh, and the area which is dry around it is pretty uh, pretty uh, warm so what we want to uh, do after restoration is that we come back in to the state uh, to, to the site uh, in very similar conditions and we uh, measure this again and we will see if, if the work was actually done well and if the wetland is working nicely. So uh, that's one of the monitoring that we do. And here is just a very simple thing which is the small water cycle uh, which I was talking about. So the sun is shining on the landscape. Uh, it's emitting the, the landscape with wetlands and uh, a lot of vegetation is emitting uh, the vapor and making clouds and it'll just, you know, fall down onto the landscape in a different place, but in a small cycle, as opposed to the big, uh, big cyclo, which is water coming from the oceans. So in the case of the Czech Republic, we have really big trouble with the small water cycle because we've lost so much, uh, so many wetlands and so much structure in the, in the landscape. And, uh, um, you know, we have really intensified uh, agriculture. So uh, and also the, the, the other problem that we have is that uh, we don't have any rivers coming into the into the country, so we can't even, you know, use any any water which would come from a different country, but uh, it's so it's flowing just out of our country. The only thing that we have is uh, the only input that we have is rain. But when it flows out of the landscape so quickly. It doesn't only cause trouble in agriculture and forestry, but it also causes trouble for you know humans. And so I'm going to go back to Myers and peatlands again. Just a quick overview, uh, which I was talking about how it works. So 9,000 years ago, this uh, area was really wet, and the uh, peat started forming. This is a plant of sphagnum moss, which has these little leaves with the special cells, uh, which contain a lot of water. So the plant actually contains about 80 to 90% of water. And uh, I just want to remind that by uh, as the as the layer of peat is growing uh, and there is no decomposition or very limited decomposition it's we are the peatlands are storing a lot of uh, material vegetation and carbon so when we are talking about uh, peatlands in the Czech Republic it's just a funny little dwarf peatland 
or just funny little dwarf peatlands. But when you talk about Taiga and Russia and the vast and vast peatlands that are there and that are uh, actually uh, on fire sometimes, that is actually a big environmental issue. So peatlands are home to a very many uh, rare species like Oxycocus polustris. Uh, some of the peaty meadows have, have this beautiful orchid called Dactyloriza uh, fuxi. We also at our peatlands have the Drosera. And then we have Vaccinum, Uruginosum, Sheuseria palustris, uh, Pedicularis palustris, and other kinds. These are some, some of the rare trees as well, Betula nana. It's a beautiful tiny birch. And uh, the Pinus uliginosa, which is uh, in the Shumava Mountains, mostly in the valley raised box. And then in, uh, in the, up in the mountains, we have the Pinus pseudopumilio. And also uh, the, the bird species called black grouse is actually using uh, peatlands and the whole mosaic around peatlands uh, for their, in different stages of, of the year of their life. And it's very important for them as well. And the, the population of black grouse uh, decreased dramatically uh, within the last 50 years. And there are already only around uh, 120, 160 or somewhere between uh, of individuals. So uh, within the project, we are also trying to support their habitat. And right now I'm going to move into uh, the uh, Life for Myers project in 2020. And I would like to show you a couple more sites which we restored and, and uh, the methods that we used and the principles that we are uh, actually um, trying to follow during restorations. So maybe if you, if you guys want to ask something or if anything was unclear, I can I can talk about it again or we can we can discuss it. I need, I need to drink. Was everything clear? Are you still there? Yes. Yeah, for me, it was <laughs> clear and I'm just waiting if someone other have some questions. We have raised hands from Barbara. Uh, can, can I ask, uh, or should I repeat? Sure. Sorry, you say again? Yeah, so uh, first of all, it was really, really interesting. So thank you very much for that. And um, yeah, I wanted to ask um, if the, the recreation, reforming of this environment might create any negative aspects for the, the cities or the people living around. Like, I don't know, um, I'm from Italy and like one of the main problems connected with the wet areas was the malaria brought mm -hmm. by the mosquitoes. If yeah. I don't know anything like that it has happened there, for example, or could happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, of course, this might be a little bit of an issue uh, with the mosquitoes, uh, but um, we are restoring in the national park. So, and, and it's it's and it's in really cool conditions, uh, very uh, cold weather, and uh, there are not many mosquitoes here, but it's 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 actually changing a little bit with the climate change. But but still, but when you're restoring uh, lower in the landscape where there are many mosquitoes, so uh, normally it is very important to uh, you know because you're working in it, with very different type of uh, landscape. Uh, uh, we are working with the protected area within the protected area, and if you work in a, in a normal, uh, normally used uh, uh, landscape, uh, it, it is very very 
very different and you are uh, restoring just you know little little wetlands somewhere where it's possible and uh, you're making you know pools and and uh, ponds and like uh, things like this and what we say is that if you uh, have the opportunity and a place in the landscape and you you know retain the water there uh, of course that there will be mosquitoes coming in but there will be also uh, the predators of their larva coming in which are uh, frogs and and other kinds of uh, species so so what we normally say is that if you have a, a bathtub in your uh, in your uh, or some kind of tank in your garden which is just for water there there can be actually very many more mosquitoes than uh, uh, in a normally functioning wetland because in the wetland you have also the predators which will lower the population of, of mosquitoes but in a separated uh, separated water tank there might be even more mosquitoes than than in the natural conditions so these are just a couple of things i can say about this so if you're making uh, if you're working on a restoration uh, in lower in the landscape you should be thinking about the conditions for for uh, I, I don't know the words. Víte někdo, jak se řeknou obojživelníci? <laughs> Czech, Czech guys? Amphibians. Amphibians. Yeah, amphibians. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what I can say about this. Thank you. I also have a question. Uh, since uh, the water from rain is quite important in Czechia, uh, do you use any remote sensing methods to assess the impact of uh, road systems on uh, the water flow direction? Uh, not on the road, not on the roads. No, we're. Uh, I'm. I'm going to talk about the monitoring uh, later. Uh, we do have some some aspects that we monitor, but there is nothing like this uh, connected with the 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 forest roads, unfortunately. But it's actually a good uh, point, and and it's a good uh, could be a good subject of a of a study for sure okay thank you uh i can send uh, the link to to the chat uh, with a paper from professor taroli from padova uh, who developed uh like a relative path impact index to assess uh, these uh, you know, these effects of path okay, cool. of uh, road systems yeah perfect thank you So I'm going to continue and uh, I'm going to show three sites uh, uh, which we restored last year. So um, on, in the video, you have seen mostly forestry uh, spring areas. And uh, what we did there was basically trying to retain as much water as possible, just, you know, trying to dysfunction the drainage system and uh, also support the structure of the stand, as I was saying in the video. Uh, so, be because normally the waterlogged forests and PT forests are really sparse, uh, really open. So with the clearings, we were trying to uh, enhance the, enhance the, uh, the cover of uh, sphagnum mosses and uh, later on uh, our foresters will also uh, do some thinning to leave uh, less trees in the stands uh, and uh, so that was in the video and here I'm going to show you uh, two sites which were restored uh, in slopes but they are uh, mostly meadows uh, or, or succession stands with um, uh, birch. So last year, uh, we managed to work on 15 sites. Uh, nine of them were completely finished and the rest 
uh, we at, at the rest of them we will continue this year uh, and uh, all together we restored an area of uh, 243 hectares and uh, four and a half kilometers of small streams uh, and uh, we blocked 37 kilometers of the drainage channels and uh, we built uh, almost 2,000 of the little wooden dams in, in the channels. And so, so this is one of the sites uh, uh, which, are, which is a spring slope. Uh, most of the springs are uh, here on the right side in the slope, which is the, the succession stand. And one spring is also here in the meadow. And below, uh, below these spring uh, slopes, there is a, a peaty meadow, which was also dried, and a valley raised bog uh, of, over here. And, and it's, it, this, this uh, section is the, the floodplains of one of the uh, larger rivers here. So, so what we did, uh, is that we tried to uh, change the direction of outflow into the original uh, direction <laughs> and uh, in, initial, initializing the, uh, the, out, uh, the, the small capillary streams that, that will go into the former direction. And we were also restoring the adjacent wetlands, which is the peaty meadows I was talking about, and uh, the the we worked a little bit in the in the floodplains uh, with a mill trace, which I'm going to show later. So this area has 33 hectares. Uh, the total length of ditches was 3.2 kilometers. And we restored a half, uh, one and a half, sorry, 1.2 kilometers of a stream. And we started uh, in summer. Uh, we couldn't start earlier because of species protection and nesting of, of rare species. And so, so the period in which we can restore is between uh, July and uh, December. <laughs> If you can hear any kids, that's my kids. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay, so, so here is the map. Uh, this is the spring slope. The light blue color circles are all the springs that are on the site. And this is the raised bog. This is the river. This is the mill trace and the PT meadow. And so, so here you can see the drainage ditches, the system of drainage ditches. And so the direction uh, of water was changed into the direction of the drainage ditches. But the slope, uh, the gradient is actually directing this way. So what we did here is that we blocked the ditches and restart the outflow in the in the natural gradient here and also we restored this little spring here and also uh, the the surface outflow as well you see a couple of photos uh, where we were blocking the ditches and it looked like this before restoration uh, you know the this this is the drying out spring area and uh, so when we blocked the ditches, we were trying to uh, not only block it with the wooden dams, but also fill it as much as possible so that we actually uh, efface it in the surface. And uh, there is another photo here that's after restoration. So you see that there is already quite uh, it, so, but sorry, this photo is during the restoration works. So you see that the water is already concentrating there. And <clears throat> this is the outflow in the drainage. 
and we needed to put it into the slope here. So uh, what we did is uh, along is that along the ditch we made little cuts here and outflows that would uh, lead the water into the slope. And like that we initialized the capillary streams, which are basically just flowing on the surface. So so the whole uh, profile uh, is is actually uh, soaked with water. This is one of the one of the little outflows from the ditch. You see that it's going into the into the wet area here. And another one here. So this is the direction of the ditches. It went through here and we cut it through in very many places uh, along the ditch and just you know let the water flow in the surface. This is before restoration and this is after restoration and you can see that the uh, the fragments of springs were reconnecting together and the whole profile uh, was again filled with with water. Sorry, my, my sister really wants to be with me. <laughs> okay. So one of the main aims here uh, in the springs is to reconnect the fragments and to raise the underground water table from the bottom of the ditches back to the surface. Uh, this is a part of the monitoring uh, of groundwater table. And basically the aim is to stabilize, raise and stabilize the groundwater table. And you can see that uh, after restoration, we did have a little bit of a success that it raised up and stabilized a little bit. And uh, we also, of course, compare it with precipitation, which are the blue lines here. And uh, so, so this is the spring area. Uh, when, when we monitor the restoration success in raised bogs, normally uh, the results are really, really great that the groundwater table raises up to the five centimeters underground and under the surface and it's working perfectly. So here is the meadow spring. So the, the blue line is showing you the drainage ditch which was here. And what we did is that we blocked it all along the way and we created the new meandering tiny little stream coming out of, of the spring. This was the ditch in the spring before restoration. You see that the whole pasture is pretty dry around the drain, around the ditch. And this is the ditch. This is the work that uh, of, of uh, installing the wooden dams. And this is after restoration. The, it's you know bare soil because it's right after restoration so we're expecting uh, some pretty interesting uh, overgrowing here with uh, we're we're really curious about what species will come in and this is the little stream before creating the stream and now it's there And this is the mill trace, uh, mill, mill trace, which was there uh, on this site as well, because it used to be a human settlement in the past. Uh, and uh, it was really deep and uh, straight. So uh, we used a special uh, restoration method uh, when we just, you know, 
take the uh, took the ex excavator, took the ground from one side, put it on the other side, then took the ground from here, put it on the other side, and just you know we tried to uh, to create a wavy meandering uh, meandering uh, stream bed and support the erosion into the banks. And talking about this site, it's pretty important to say that it <clears throat> used to be uh, it, it it was used as pasture for cattle, and uh, we so we had to do a couple of negotiations with the farmer here, who is uh, who is uh, actually using this land. Uh, it's in the property of the national park, but he is in lease and. Uh, so, so we had to talk about the restoration also with this guy, and uh, we withdrawn fifteen percent of the pasture uh, from him, and he has to uh, fence it out. And uh, I just wanted to point out that it's not uh, that the restoration measures don't mean that uh, it cannot be uh, used in other ways than uh, nature protection but uh, it can be still used for farming, but uh, just, you know, a little bit less. And then here is another spring slope. You can see that this is also a spring area. Uh, all the waters come in really fast away from there instead of spilling in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, profile and on the whole slope we uh, have little spring areas and wet and peaty meadows so we're we were trying to restore the whole complex of spring <clears throat> and the extremely deep erosion channels were blocked uh, to you know raise the water from the from the bottom again and uh, we were restoring the natural uh, outflow on the surface so again, it had 42 hectares. Uh, the length of ditches was over eight kilometers and uh, the restored stream had almost four kilometers. We started last summer and you can see this is the state before restoration. So all these springs were cut with drainage ditches, which are the lines here very deep and all the water from this area was running off really fast and this is the aim uh, the map in the project documentation and uh, you see that the we we are uh you know dysfunctioning the drainage system and recreating the original outflow which are the green little streams and the fun part about this area is that uh, in the lower part the beavers helped us and they actually built a couple of dams on the drainage channels so we don't have to work over there anymore uh, and we will just work in the slope this is one of the ditches before restoration this is how it looks after restoration so you see that we're trying to efface it as much as possible. This is one of the hugest channels and after restoration it looks like this. We are using the soil from the banks, from the site, from the deposits uh, and trying to uh, fill the ditch as much as possible. And the water that was flowing in the bottom is raised up to the surface and uh, this is the plan of a stream which was then restored like this. And you can also see it on this aerial photo that uh, these are the ditches, the deep channels that were there before. And the excavator is working on effacing them. And this, um, the, the operator already created the new little stream here. This is how it looks. This is the operator doing work on the outflow in this little stream. 
And then we have the third site, which is actually the first site in the video. And those are waterlogged, waterlogged and bog forests in the spring uh, forested area and a raised bog lower, lower in the uh, gradient. And again, we restored the natural water regime. Uh, as I said, we did the clearing. So we were trying to restore the sparse waterlogged forest stands. And uh, again, just dysfunctioning the drainage, which was also in the raised bog, because most probably people from the area were planning to uh, ex uh, to uh, excavate some of the peat uh, and use it for heating, but they didn't after all. But but they only did the drainage, made made the ditches. So this is one of the larger areas. It has almost 60 hectares, 13 kilometers of ditches, and we are restored two kilometers of streams. So again, the state before and after restoration. This is the spring area, the wet meadows, uh, and this is the the uh, the direction of the iron curtain. And Around the road of the Iron Curtain, there were huge ditches which we blocked as well. And, and so the whole system took all the water down these ditches and into the uh, river of Studená Vltava. And this part is, uh, is the raised bog. And you can see that there is a channel uh, over here and here. Sorry. I'm going to go back and so this is the aim in the project documentation again blocking ditches restoration of streams and restoration of the springs this is the spring area before restoration this is a pretty interesting photo because you can see that in the forest stand we could in very many cases, find the former stream bed of the of the streams, which when which were then ch channelized. So sometimes the only job we had to do is to block the ditch, and to send the water the flow back into the original uh, stream. It, it was really a cool work because when you look at it before restoration and then then after, so you see that. Uh, you're just renewing the beautiful little street, uh, forest stream. It, it's it's the funnest part of the of the job. <laughs> and this is this is the uh, channelized stream in the floodplains of Studená uh, Vltava River, and uh, so we also changed it into a meandering uh, little stream, which already in this spring period of melting, snow melting, uh, spilled, spill into the, spilled into the floodplains and into the whole area around here. And again, the, the monitoring of underground water table. So you see that uh, the first, these are the first results, you know, just, just after restoration uh, of the higher, uh, part of the area of, of the site and it's just uh, until the end of last year uh, but you can see that it's pretty visible that the before the restoration the water table uh, was pretty unstable going up and down because of the drainage system and then after restoration it it really stabilized and talking about the monitoring uh, I just uh, want to mention that uh, we're uh, also assessing the impact of restoration works uh, on uh, the runoff, which is this photo here. So uh, we have a standardized uh, outflow, uh, which is monitored uh, with the, uh, what is the, what is the word? Sorry, I can't find the word. So, so we're just monitoring how much water is flowing out uh, every every ten minutes, 
and uh, we are comparing this data with the rainfall, with precipitation, and uh, then we get to know how much water the whole area was able to retain uh, in a specific amount of uh, precipitation and how fast it flew, uh, it, it uh, uh, not flew, but uh, ran off uh, the whole area. And uh, then we compare it with the data after restoration and we will learn if, if the runoff will be also a bit more stabilized, which is the, which is the goal of restoration works. <clears throat> so uh, we really want to learn about the water retention in the landscape. And then we are also monitoring the water quality at 15 sites, uh, 15 project sites. And uh, so, so at the end of the catchment area, we collect samplings of water and we are trying to learn uh, what kind of pH, electronic conductivity, uh, dissolved org organic carbon and aluminium uh, uh, there was in the water um, before and after restoration. And we will also again learn about the changes in water quality uh, after restoration. Uh, then our colleagues from the university in Budweis are monitoring the uh, soil processes and peat decomposition and uh, peat forming processes, which uh, we expect will uh, come back to the sites after restoration. Uh, then we are monitoring, they are also monitoring the cooling effect, which I was already talking about. And also we are uh, monitoring the uh, species. So uh, we have uh, four by four meters plots where we monitor the vegetation and we will uh, try to learn if, if the vegetation, vegetation uh, wetland vegetation is coming back into the site. But yeah. This is uh, a couple of photos uh, from from the sites, but it's of course uh, the best to see it uh, on the site. So uh, I just would like to suggest any of you, if you have a you know, uh, if you have a group of people who are interested in these kinds of uh, restoration measures uh, in the Shumava National Park, uh, if you have a students union and people would like to take a trip and take a look at it uh, uh, here in Shumava National Park. Uh, I will be always happy to host you and uh, show you some of the places. Uh, and yeah, it's always the best. So uh, just for the end of my presentation, I would like to mention a couple of uh, dissemination activities and activities for public that we do. So we're trying to engage people in the restoration. Oh, sorry, I didn't translate this. Uh, but uh, every year we are uh, organizing about 12 to 15 events for groups of 20 people who actually come with us to the sites and they help us with uh, tiny little works that we need to do on the site. Specifically, this year uh, during the restoration season, we will walk around all the restoration works that were done last year and we will do little, uh, you know, corrections. And uh, so, so it's not like you would go there uh, work on the restoration and leave it forever, but you have to, you know, the, the, the three years after restoration are uh, critical uh, for the best results. So if, if you come in after melting period, uh, uh, you know, and a uh, big amount of water going through the site, uh, the restored site, you have to check on all the measures that you have done. And uh, if there are any mistakes or any, any problematic uh, sections uh, we have to fix it and for that we use the help of volunteers <clears throat> so 
you know, people come in and help us with these tiny works that we have to do. Last year we had over 200 people helping us, which is pretty uh, good. And like that, we actually uh, managed to, you know, tell people very many things about wetlands and uh, they work for half the day and they take an excursion with us to places which are not uh, drained and they are in the natural state and we can, you know, uh, make them passionate about wetlands and make them uh, talk about wetlands within their families and uh, with their friends. And uh, this, is, this is a really good way to uh, disseminate uh, the, the knowledge that we have about wetlands. And we also, so here you can see a couple of photos of the happy people who helped wetlands in the Shumova National Park. And a couple of photos from the work that they do. They help us also to um, distribute building material to places which are not accessible for excavators. And they help us to uh, distribute uh, plant, uh, the wetland vegetation for you know, su supporting the faster overgrowing of the drainage ditches. And uh, they also help us with building some of the, some of the uh, wooden dams in places where we really cannot uh, let the excavator go because they are too wet and that's that's this case so they really enjoy the time with us and then we you know uh, lead them through the most beautiful parts of the national park and uh, they're really passionate about the nature the beautiful nature that we have here And also we have uh, some events for local people. We try to, because, because in the national park, we have a couple of villages which are uh, within the national park. And so the locals really need to know about all the measures that we do because it's a protected area. So if they see a, an excavator anywhere, they, we, we really want to make sure that they know that it's us, that we are working on the restoration of water regime. And um, we also uh, organize discussions with the local people. Uh, we create leaflets uh, about the restoration site so that they actually have something at home in which they can look. And we meet the mayors of these villages quite often and try to explain them all the measures that we are working on. And then we have also, of course, very many other communication activities like uh, a video document uh, about restorations that we are uh, going to work on this year. Uh, then uh, a book uh, for kids about water in the landscape and a, a whole tutorial programs for schools uh, and many, many more. You can also check the website if you like. Uh, it's live.mpsumava.cz slash en in English slash de in German. And yeah, that's it from my side. And uh, I would like to say thank you that you're uh, interested in, in the water retention in the landscape. And uh, just if you have any questions, you, uh, you, you should ask me. And if I know the answer, I will try to uh, respond. OK, thank you very much for your nice and interesting presentations. And uh, I. I can also only recommend uh, to, to come there and to see you on your own because when I came there to, to see all the places when we were taking the video, it's really nice to see how, 
how the nature is taking these uh, places back and uh, after the restoration and how moist it is. And thank you also for your great work there in, in the National Park. Hopefully there will be more projects like this in the future. And we had few raised hands. So I saw Elif, Johannes. So Elif, you can ask. Hello. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting and the visual, visuals were also really amazing and easy to understand. Uh, I have two questions actually. First yeah. one is about the restoration team and the second one is about the target water table concept. Um, the first one is the target water table concept. It's the first time I see it and it seems pretty successful concept. So I was wondering the indicators before planning about it and like uh, how old data you have used in terms of the water precipitation. Thank you. Sorry, uh, what, what was the first question about the water target uh, concept? Uh, I was wondering uh, before planning this uh, concept, uh, what indicators you have used and how long they have old data you have um, mm -hmm. you have like used before planning the concept. Well, uh, the the concept of was actually sort of developed here. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, our uh leader of the project she had been working for the national park since 1993 and she was the one uh, she's a geobotanist and she was the one who really was uh, so concerned about all the uh drained peat box and as i said she started uh the researching about it and she learned some of this already in Scotland and Finland. And uh, but was that the conditions there are a little bit different because we are working in slopes, right? So uh, most of, like most of the peatlands in Finland are just flat areas, uh, and it's easy to just you know fill because the the power of water uh, is not that big but here in the slopes uh, she had to uh, adjust the methods to the conditions so that's why she started thinking about uh, using the wooden dam uh, the already the, and, and Scotland uh, uh, in Scotland as well and um, the, but they used some kind of plastic dams and stuff like that so we couldn't really use it in the uh, she couldn't really use it in the national park and so so she came in with the wooden dams and uh, she, she already had some information about this concept of, and during the time, uh, site after site, she, she could see the results of restoration differently. So she was basically working on the on the methods of restoration during time. Uh, one of the specifically one of, one of the things that she learned during that time was that space between the dams as much as possible with any organic material that is on, on the site. Because uh, like that, you lower the amount of water that is between the wooden dams and you avoid uh, damage on the dams during winter when the, when, when the water froze and uh, grows in size. So, you know, it's, it makes mechanic changes. And also because the sphagnum mosses really need something under to grow on. So if you just throw in many, many uh, branches, little twigs, uh, it'll help the sphagnum to overgrow the ditches as fast as possible. So, so, but that's something that she learned during the time. And 
so so basically the target water table concept uh, is came from scotland and is a bit adjusted to the conditions here in the mountain uh, mountain ridge so it was more like on site process and it developed in there okay. pretty much yes yeah. That's great. And my second question was about the restoration team. Um, I was wondering like how diverse is the restoration team, which disciplines you have, uh, the team members and like um, how often do you accept new members? Because this presentation really developed my interest in the peatland restoration. And yeah, it seems very fascinating also. It is really, and all of us are actually happy that we can work for a project like this, that's for sure. And uh, so so the woman who developed the method and started the restoration in the Shumava National Park is a geobotanist. But as I said, also during the time, she learned very many things about river dynamics, the, the system of, of rivers and uh, the system of peatlands, uh, and she learned a lot about water during that time. So she's a she's a real professional. And then the the other people who work on uh, the restoration uh, measures uh, are here since 90, uh, 2009, uh, Sorry, two thousand eighteen. So they we all only uh, have been here for three years. And uh, so some of us are uh, botanists, some of us are, <laughs> uh, uh, um, sorry, hydrologist. One guy is a hydrologist. Uh, and one guy is actually uh, a bit older than us. And he did the, he made the drainage system uh before uh like in in the landscape not on not uh on the in the area of shumava but lower in the landscape he was actually working for a company state company of course in in the um uh, on on uh, drainage works so it, it, it's fairly crazy that he now works in the opposite way <laughs> but yeah that's how it is. So he's good in const constructions, obviously. And he has, he has the experience how the drainage was made. So that's really good to have him as well. And uh, yeah, so, but all of these people I was talking about are just field workers and they all do the same stuff. They were mapping and monitoring the sites before uh, uh, the creation of project documentations. And then they are uh, uh, they are in contact with the people who are working on the project documentations. And now they are actually on the site with the company working on the restoration measures. And they are, you know, just supervising them and uh, trying to con uh, control if if everything is uh, uh, being done according to the project documentation. But because they are so diverse in uh, education, it's actually a very good team because, you know, everybody has something to say. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Johannes? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for, for this presentation. It was really good and also the videos. Very good. I will definitely watch them a second time. And um, my question is, I think a little bit out of topic, but uh, I was today reading something about microplastic and stuff in the news. And I was wondering if you are thought about measuring, like when, when you measure the, the speed of the water coming down and the pH level and stuff, if you uh, measure, um, yeah, kind of microplastic maybe in the future? Uh, well, um... I think that uh, it could be a topic because it's already uh, also f was found in rain, wasn't it? Was it found in rain or not? 
I don't know. I'm not sure, but I mean, it's bad when when you find microplastic in a national park and this. Um, yeah. Did you know yeah, I'm know? just I'm just wondering. You know, uh, it would be uh, it could be a topic for us if if the microplastic would come in uh, uh, in uh, precipitation because. Uh, it's actually the, the the greatest issue about this is that is it's uh, the microplastic is in gray water and it's going into rivers and it's going into oceans and stuff like that. But uh, I think I've read an article about uh, microplasts in, in the vapor already, but I'm not sure now. I can't really remember clearly, but yeah. So, so there is not, that much pollution in the national park that we would uh, perceive this as as an issue so we're not we haven't been thinking about this and it's especially on the project sites we are just little catch which are just little catchments uh in places where there are no villages and nothing like that so haven't been thinking about this yet but uh yeah it's a, it's a good point and i will try to look up a bit more information about it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you too. Okay, we have a question from Simone also. Yes. Um, also thank you for the presentation. It was quite interesting to really learn what you were doing here. And I have a question about like on the, on the long-term process of the restoration log. So like after how many years do you, do you consider that the land is fully restored besides the first big work you need to do some subsequent stuff and also i think you're going to keep some kind of inventory of peatlands and not peatlands and like so at some point your restore should will be considered natural but i don't know how long mm -hmm. it takes well the process of uh regrowing and renaturalization or however i can call it is really fast it's quite it's quite fascinating uh, especially in the non-PT areas like spring slopes because the site which I was showing you uh, was partly overgrown already in the last year. So, so this, is, this is pretty fast. Uh, and talking about peatlands, uh, so, so uh, our colleagues from the university are studying the peat forming processes and uh, there is actually quite a quick response of the site uh, when the uh, when the profile of peat uh, rewettens again. So the peat forming processes is uh, are coming back pretty much uh, right in the moment of restoration. Yeah. So so with the restoration, the degradation of peat is really stopped quickly. And the peat forming processes are coming in real fast. So, so that those are the results from the past restoration works. So we, we, uh, you know, uh, think that th this will this will continue on the new sites as well. And uh, talking about uh, sphagnum moss, uh, you can see how vivid this this organism is uh, here in the national park also in the parts uh, where uh, like in the plains up in the mountains uh, where the forest stand was uh, uh, you know uh, well there was a big uh, bark beetle outbreak and uh, hundreds of hectares of forests were just uh, eaten by the bark beetle, let's, let's say. And uh, that's in the area where there is very many wetlands, uh, uh, peatlands, the raised bogs. And uh, of course, the, the sphagnum moss is in every little spot which is wet in, in these areas. So uh, before the outbeat, out be, uh, uh, outbreak of bark beetle, uh, the, as the forest was pretty thick and uh, there was not much light coming down on the ground, 
the there were places where there was no sphagnum moss at all, but the scientists from the uh, uh, university in Budweis could see a big change after uh, the death of the uh, tree layer. And as, the, as more light was coming in, the sphagnum started spreading all over the place. So that is quite a, a nice thing to learn about how the, uh, the spruce, mountain spruce forests work. Uh, in terms of water retention, because <clears throat> as as the whole uh, stand just disappeared from there, of, but meaning uh, in terms of shade, uh, a lot of that sphagnum was spreading around. So so that means a bigger capacity of wa water retention, and as as the as the trees will grow overgrow the area back again. Uh, you know, this will change again uh, in, in terms of shade and, and the sphagnum will just start disappearing from the area slowly, but it will stay in the places which will be open and full of light and full of water. So this is how the, you can learn how the peatlands were moving around uh, in the mountains. And uh, I just wanted to say how, how uh, that it is really interesting how dynamic uh, the the forests are that they are still changing in time because bark beetle outbreaks used to be here uh, every time we had the M spruce mountain forest uh, up in the mountains so, so all the time I mean so so it's really interesting to see the mechanisms of the ecosystem and also to see how important it is for the forest to just die out. Uh, uh, once upon a time and you know all the dead wood will help also with water retention uh, in the slopes and uh, you know support the creation of soil processes and stuff like that so just very I just want to say that it's very interesting to uh, observe all this was it uh, was it everything or yeah. did I miss uh, to, did I forget to answer anything? No, that's fine, thanks. And, but actually I have now another question. Is that yeah. by restoring uh, these uh, wetland, peatland, you're going to uh, store carbon. And are you and thinking of like sending carbon credits for your work in any form? Uh, sorry, say again, if we are what? Since you are storing carbon by yeah your activities. Are you planning to sell carbon credits for your work since you're kind of like directly mitigating? Uh, we were discussing this just uh, in joke, <laughs> but no, not really. Uh, we are more, fo more focused on, you know, uh, saving the peatlands than anything like uh, anything that is going on uh, in the society, <laughs> more focused on nature than society. <laughs> but an interesting question. Thank you. I have a short question too. Yeah. Um, when you uh, dig the stream, did you use uh, some um, measures and counting for the shape of the stream or just uh, randomly, you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, it's uh, mostly based on, it, on experience. It's mostly based on observing uh, natural streams. And uh, when you're restoring a stream, as I showed, uh, so uh, the, the tiny little streams that are going out from, from flowing from the springs, uh, that's just pretty, uh, pretty easy because you see where the tiny little valley is and you know that sometime in the future before drainage, this uh, stream used to be there. But, but you can really see uh, the topography the terrain and 
uh, you, you a li, a li, the vegetation will show you a little bit as well because if there is yunkus and other kinds of wetland species, you see that uh, this is the this is the pathway, the original pathway of the stream. And then according to the slope, the gradient, you know how many of the curves you have to make and how steep it should be or less steep. And uh, when talking about the bigger stream, uh, which was in the video, that's that's a bit bigger and it's in the floodplains in a, in a flat area. So it had uh, so the gradient was smaller and it had uh, way more meanders, but uh, in that case, uh, they had to do some hydrological countings of the uh, flow of the stream. And according to the flow that was expected, uh, they had to design the stream bed. Okay, with hydrologists, they have to count uh, how large is the stream bed supposed to be. Yeah, and when they were looking for the original stream bed, in, the, uh, in this case, they used, uh, they used the time of spring flooding because the landscape has its memory and the water as well. And that when the area was flooded, they could actually see the original uh, original course of the stream. And uh, then they used the vegetation as well. And they used some old uh, old um, uh, maps, uh, like, like mil military maps, uh, which uh, still had these, uh, these str this stream in the original shape. So just to learn about the position of the stream, they, they used some of the maps as well. And also you can try to find the sediments. So you, you have a meadow, uh, which is the former floodplain of the stream, and you go and uh, make cores. And if you find the sediments, you, you can learn uh, if this was the, really the, the original course of the stream. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. It's really interesting. <laughs> I mean, the whole process of, you know, trying to find the stream. And you also told me that you were using LiDAR, LiDAR data for that? Oh, yes, that's, that's, but that's, uh, that's not the case of this stream because it was in, uh, it was restored in 2013. And, uh, uh, so, so in these days, we are losing, uh, we are not losing, but using uh, the LiDAR data, uh, which is like uh, laser monitor, laser sensoring of the landscape from the plane. And then uh, you get, you get a very, very precise uh, idea about the topography of the terrain. Uh, and you can see even, you know, really little uh, changes in the terrain. And we used it. I'm, I'm actually going to show it because it's quite, it's quite uh, interesting. Uh, give me a second. And so, so for these restoration works, we did the monitoring on site, but we also did, uh, we did the monitoring with the GPS on site, uh, tried to, you know, uh, learn about all the drainage ditches uh, and put all these in the map. But this later data helped us a lot because, because it's just amazing technology. Uh, but I just have to find where I have a... So...
Okay. I'm going to share my screen. So this is it. Uh, the red line are the borders of one project site. And you see that the whole system of drainage ditches is so easily visible. And it's so good for people who are working with the project documentations and they're planning all the restoration works. You see that this site is also a forested uh, spring area. So here are some springs. There you go. Ditches, ditches, you know, flowing through here. Uh, this is this was a this was a really deep channelized stream. There is a little uh, spring here. It was also drained like this. So yeah, this technology really helps us a lot now. Thank you. And we have a question from Damiano. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you mentioned before, like a case where there was a farmer involved. And uh, like in general, did you have any issues convincing people that were uh, actively involved in the management of the of the lens? Or was it easy to like involve them in the discussion and something connected to, to this? Um, I don't know how it works in Czech Republic if in case, for example, in parks, people are allowed to pick mushrooms or berries and so on. Uh, and I assume that changing like the, the, the environment, creating restoring pitlands that might influence those aspects too. So what was the reaction of the, of the like society of the people there? Mm -hmm. So it's changing in time. Uh, later in the past, people were completely not used to this. You know, they were, uh, you know, uh, trying to swear at the administration of the national park and, and and say that they're doing crazy stuff because they are digging inside of the national park and things like that. <clears throat> so the first steps were pretty hard, but it's a different uh, it's a different situation now. It's way better. People have more information from us. This project is also really important because we have money and time to talk to local people and explain everything. And um, then, uh, yeah, uh, we are in a good position because we are in a national park, which is mostly uh, privately owned land by the Czech Republic. And uh the farmers are mostly on lease so they uh, they pretty much understand that they are in a national park and that we have this kind of plans with the uh the meadows and the property uh, that the czech republic has and uh that we want to restore the water regime and the so, so it's uh, basically about just explaining why we are doing it, uh, how much they will lose from the uh, pasture and stuff like that. But we also have sites where we have uh, people who own the land and they're not, uh, it's not owned by the Czech Republic, but it's not uh, administrated by the national park, uh, but they still want to uh, gave us the permission to do the restoration works. So <clears throat> uh, it's completely different when you think about restorations in the privately used land, uh, lower in the Czech Republic, um, where you have to do you know very many negoti negotiations. The land is uh, owned in small. <clears throat> strips you know there are very many owners and you have to negotiate a lot <clears throat> but one of the goals of this project is actually to train people who uh, have all the information uh, can are are good in negotiating and also uh, we have 
um, due to this project, we have the restoration sites where we can show this. So uh, as the site Malibor, which I was talking about the case with the farmer, uh, we now have a restoration site. And if we want to do another restoration work, in the future somewhere where there are private owners or anything else, we will say, okay, come on, let's make an excursion. We will show you how it looks. And it's and this is a really uh, good thing to have because if they see it with their own eyes, that it's not such a big impact on, on their farming uh, and grazing that uh, helps a lot. So during the seven years of uh, the project, Project, we will uh, work on the development of, uh, you know, uh, methods, how to show people uh, how, how important it is to restore the water regime and how we do it and how it's possible to do it in a really close to nature way. Okay, so are there any more questions? Uh, if no, I would like to say a big thank you to Mr. Linhar for his very nice presentation. And I hope that uh, we or uh, I uh, will be able to go uh, to Shumava Mountains and see our restorations in person. Yeah, thank you too. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for your questions. And as I said before, uh, I'll be always, always happy to host you here. I'm really sad that I cannot uh, be with you here right now. And let's hope for better times and that we can meet in person and discuss all the topics a little bit more in detail. I would like also uh, to say that uh... I think we can make an excursion in the Shimova National Park with you, with our LC, if you agree. Or maybe we can uh, help you with some restoration as a volunteer. So we will stay in touch and, um, yeah, stay in touch. Okay, <laughs> That's it. perfect. Yeah, I'll be, happy. I'll, I'll be happy to organize one day or a weekend for you. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you once again. So we can go on uh, uh, with our program, I guess. Uh, so I will give a word to Misha and she will tell you a little bit about uh, our evening program, about our creative time. So it's yours. Um, actually, now we are going to have a Kahoot quiz where you can uh, win some prizes. So uh, please take your mobile phone. Do we have it now, right? I have a question. Yeah. Um, should we postpone the Kahoot Wits to tonight evening and try to get more people in the call and have a break now? Between the uh, session. Yeah, it's very short, but yeah, okay. So uh, if uh, if you are going to join in the okay, yeah, I yeah. think uh, I think we should because yesterday when we did it.